Hi, Stuart here. Today with a little bit longer video, a discussion of my point of view on domain-driven design with some help from my friends. Um, just a disclaimer, there's no way that I could make this into a full end-to-end -end tutorial. But for those of you who are interested in DDD or are interested to see what DDD could do for you, uh, this video might be helpful. I'd like to thank my contributors and just say that any mistakes are mine, anything useful is down to them. And lastly, I want to thank Eric Evans and all the people who came after him for making it possible to, in theory, deliver software that is better than before. So I want to start with solid because all the different trends in software development that I've ever seen not that are useful, not one of them has ever contradicted the fundamental laws of solid that date back to the smoky ancestral times when, when developers had no ones, only zeros. And so solid is the foundation upon which all great software ideas and implementations stand. And if you don't have a solid foundation, what you don't have is usually good software. So most of you know the, the solid acronym already. For those of you who don't, there's a bunch of great Wikipedia articles and tutorials, but I just wanted to put a stake in the ground and say, I want to start with solid and I think about it a lot. And as we go through the rest of the deck, I will occasionally make references for it. So if you're not comfortable or familiar with Solid, you may want to just stop this video and go watch a different video or, you know, do some research and get comfortable with some of the ideas in the Solid uh, acronym. The other thing that is kind of a base for me when designing software, these are more implementation things but you cannot do software architecture, software design without considering implementation. And so for me, the 12factor.net factors from the 12factor.net manifesto, which you can go to their website and read all about. And you can also go on this same channel and see my 12 videos on 12 factors. I did a video on each of the 12 factors. And again, if you're a little fuzzy on some of these, then it would be great to stop and go and look at that before we dive in, as I'll be referring to them occasionally throughout this presentation. Um, additionally, it's nice to know coupling and cohesion as terms. I've included uh, a couple of really great articles, one Wikipedia, of course, and one that was written by the good people at geeksforgeeks.org. And they have a nice tutorial on coupling and cohesion and about why they're important. So we want high cohesion and low coupling. And that actually is an excellent uh, set of things that we're trying to get to in DDD, which we'll get into shortly. So I wanted to make it clear right from the off about an important kind of prerequisite concept. And it's the difference between types and instances. And if you are used to a typeless language, of which there are very few, but there are some, or things where types are soft and squishy, uh, JavaScript, for example, uh, you may not have the same way of thinking about types and instances that a C-sharp or Java developer uh, or Go developer might have. So a type is about uh, a little bit of knowledge, but mostly types to, are to define behavior and strategy. And types can also be used to, to define as part of that strategy, uh, one or more datagrams that go along with that. When you make an instance of a type at runtime, what you get is the actual state, the actual values of the properties that are in the type, if any. And instances have a lifetime. So, you know, you're, you're five minutes into the program, you create a new instance of, of foo, and foo lives for a certain amount of time and then it dies. So instances have a lifetime and they have a distinct place in the pipeline between when they're created, 
and when they're disposed. So type the type system in C sharp, right, is, a, is an affordance for knowledge level. And when you new up types in C sharp, and I'm going to be using C sharp as my example throughout the presentation, it's the language I'm happiest and most comfortable in, then what you're getting is operational level things. In other words, you're getting actual instances. And uh, typically types are singular uh, and uniquely named. And we're going to talk about why that's important uh, later. Most of the time, programming languages uh, insist on it anyway. If you have the same scope and you declare two variables or two types or two anything, it'll typically go, eh, you got to disambiguate those. And instances, of course, are from zero to n. And in C sharp, of course, uh, they types exist as, as artifacts. Uh, so you can actually go into the generated code and browse the types. In fact, one of the strongest things about .NET is that unlike something like C, which is then compiled and optimized, that the compiled targets retain their knowledge of types. And this allows you to explore the types that are available, even if you don't have source code. So let's talk about uh, plain old language objects and persistence ignorance. So there are a lot of different philosophies and object oriented about how you should create objects. And for simplicity in DDD, what we typically do is say, well, we want to, when we build a class, so, you know, in C sharp, we're talking about classes. That's what we're talking about. We build a class. We want it to represent data and behavior. Uh, but we don't want that data and behavior um, to have knowledge of the outside world, if humanly possible. So we want to avoid business logic unless it's called self-referencing. And so here's an example of that. If I have a property setter and there's some validation logic and there are some formatting logic, that's legit. If I have methods that operate on the class itself and do computations, that's legit. And the thing about that is that in those cases, right, those classes are actually closer in concept to what we used to call DTOs or data transfer objects, right? And so the thing about that is if you build polos, then the, the polo doesn't care how it's persisted, right? You can you can use a, a factory, you can use a repository pattern, you can use, you know, pretty much anything. And it does, the, the, the object itself should not and does not care. And by the way, that's just a generally good thing to do in most programming languages anyway. You want to separate out the persistence tier from the business domain, which can, which includes your business objects or polos. A happy note about that is that there are a bunch of nice patterns that you can use. You can use the factory pattern, you can use the repository pattern. And the idea is, is that the factory pattern or repository pattern may even be implemented as a, a set of static helpers, or they may be implemented in as some sort of context object as they are an entity framework. But as far as the classes are concerned, they really don't care. They don't know that they're being manipulated by, for example, Entity Framework. They get hydrated and rehydrated. And in the middle, they get, they potentially get mutated or they get copied. And the, and the copy as it's being mutated, as in F sharp, is got values reset. And in the new C sharp, um, you can use the record type for that kind of thing where records are, are classes that are immutable. But when you make a copy of that class, you can then set the properties that are different about from the, from the, from the original to the copy. And that uh, ha makes it so that your DTOs are immutable. Um, not a bad pattern. 
uh, in many cases. In other cases, you spend your lifetime making copies of objects. And if you look at your object graph in memory at runtime, you may regret that set of choices. So like everything else, there's trade-offs. So I, a word about persistence ignorance, right? If you are using a handy dandy framework that does a lot of heavy lifting for you, and in order to use that framework efficiently, you have to give your, your business objects things that you would hope that would be POCOs, but really you need to just give them that much more context to make them interoperate. That's not the worst thing in the world, right? So it's a goal and it's one of those things you should apply the Pareto rule to, e.g. maybe 80% is good enough, but let's not make our POCO objects so aware of their persistence that in fact modifying them becomes really hard. So Don Box and others, but Don Box really expressed really well, the four tenets of service orientation. Why service orientation is important in DDD, we will see shortly, but the four rules are service are, uh, are autonomous, services have explicit boundaries, services expose schema and contract, not class or type, and a nice example of this for .NET developers is the open API JSON or YAML format that says, you know, here are my operations, here are my datagrams. And those things don't have to correspond to the innards of your domain models. In fact, they probably shouldn't. And service compatibility is based on, on policies. And there are lots of nice policy engines um, that you can use at runtime and they can be used in in concert with best programming practices like semantic versioning and other things so that you can do service bindings based on you know duct typing or or based on matching things that are close and then policies can also be used for access control and what something can do and uh, you know, in what subset of data things are allowed to operate in and so forth, right? So we'll talk more about services when we dive into DDD. One last thing. Throughout this presentation, I have a set of document um, diagramming things that I like, that I sort of habitually use. They're chosen because they're easy to draw in SharePoint, and I find myself doing um, a lot less Visio and a lot more SharePoint. Uh, and so these are just things that are easy to draw in style. So we have, you know, uh, boxes with titles and those are classes. We have oval rounded off boxes and those are typically enumerations or constants. And then you have composition, association, aggregation, inheritance, and so on and we're going to talk about each of those but you know in, in the in the in the description we're going to have these notations so it's helpful to provide a little key or demuxing so aggregation is the difference between aggregation and composition gets mixed up a lot aggregation is in math terms a set or a collection of something and so the relationship between what segment, marketing segment, a customer is in and the customer is an aggregation because there's no hard relationship between a segment and a customer other than the relation. So you can delete customers to your heart's content and the segment doesn't care. Composition is about parent-child relationships. And so in the sort of traditional customer order, order detail, product thing, order detail must have order as a parent and you can't delete an order, right? And so that's kind of referential integrity if you're a relational database SQL type of person, right? So think of composition as, as, as a foreign key with RI and an aggregation is a foreign key without it if you're a SQL person. Again, association is is a relationship 
<clears throat> that says this thing is pointing to that thing. So an order detail has a reference to product. And in theory, a product should not be deleted if order details reference it. And if you're a SQL person, you're going, well, that's just a foreign key relationship with a specific set of, of conditions. And you're right, but in the object modeling universe, the difference between composition and association is that I can create as many products as they want and they never have to appear in an order detail. In composition, the parent and child must both exist and that's the difference. And then lastly, in C Sharp, we think, put things like enumerations and constants into a set and the notation we use is a dashed arrow line. And that just says, you know, we're constraining the value of this thing to be in that set whether it's a group of constants and enumeration, what have you. Another thing that's notationally interesting is covariance. And you see this a lot in complicated business systems with inheritance, where we have this generic purchase order and purchase order detail, and they have a parent and child relationship, right? But in the abstract, in the concrete, we have uh, an inherited child, a purchase order, that's an equipment purchase order with certain additional fields and a software purchase order with a different set of fields. And so if I want to then have a product order detail, I want to have a product order detail for equipment purchase orders and a different one for software purchase orders. And this sort of arrangement is called covariance. And in programming languages, especially in C Sharp, you can use um, attributes. You can use lots of other uh, clever tricks. You can use a rules engine to enforce this sort of thing. And if you are using the factory pattern to create instances, what you say is, well, I'm never going to allow someone to create a generic purchase order but I am going to let people create a purchase order of type whatever. And then, then by fiat, um, it will have an I enumerable collection typically of the appropriate uh, subclass. So in this case, if I create an equipment uh, purchase order class instance, it'll have an I enumerable of equipment purchase order details and no other. So this is where a factory pattern can enforce covariance. But of course, anything that operates on a PO detail or anything that operates on a PO, um, as long as you follow the Liskov substitution principle, the essentials of a purchase order, like unique order number and date and you know details have a certain common set of business rules that you can pass either an equipment or a software um, purchase order to something that knows how to deal with it and it will do the right thing. And this is um, a loose sort of duct typing that you find in other uh, languages. Normally covariance is generally not a good idea because it forces other constraints on your system, but there are absolutely business cases where what we want to get accomplished requires covariance. And then I want to take a few minutes and just stop and talk about inheritance in C Sharp. Again, strictly speaking, you don't need to know this to understand DDD, but it's important when you're doing DDD to understand the consequences when you go to implement those ideas in actual code. Because eventually, to be useful, all of our diagrams and drawings and abstractions need to be turned into code. So um, everyone who's worked with, in, with languages that support inheritance is familiar with the weak base class problem. And especially they're familiar with it when the inheritance tree gets too deep. And for my taste, too deep is set at five. Um, actually, two, five is way too deep. I get uncomfortable if it's more than two or three layers deep. And I tend to instead, like many other developers in C Sharp, 
we tend to use interfaces instead. And since interfaces can now have a partial implementation of methods, uh, you can get a lot of the benefits of inheritance, but you can mark the class as sealed, which makes it run much faster uh, at runtime because in an inheritance scenario at runtime, the runtime has to stop and figure out, as in the covariance example, is this a, a infrastructure purchase order or a, or a software purchase order? If you use uh, inher inheritance, but you use it softly by implementing an interface as a duct type, and you can use, again, you can use that to have a partial or default implementation, uh, things get a lot easier. I'm not being down on inheritance. It absolutely has its places, but I'm just saying in general, we wanna be wary of deeply nested inheritance, and we wanna be very clear on what the alternatives and their pros and cons are in our chosen platform. And again, my examples are for C Sharp. So we talk about, we have to talk about cardinality, right? We've introduced these sort of seven high level concepts and we need to know what the rules are for aggregation and composition. And these are the rules. So for example, for covariance, we have a rule that there, it needs to be deterministic. In other words, it needs to be a one-to-one. -one. Interfaces by their definition are one-to-one, -one. Uh, but an object can implement many interfaces and an interface can be used on many types. So there's that. Sets tend to be unique, right? Collections of constants, collections of innumerables, you know, they have uniqueness. So you can read more about that on Wikipedia, but just sort of keep in mind in the back of your head that cardinality is important. And I want to stop and talk about canonical and models and canonical notations. Um, when is a duck not a duck? Um, when it's not a duck. And while there are a number of canonical schemas out in the universe, right, for grocery, insurance, healthcare, whatever, understand that those schemas are interface contracts at the service tier and not domain models. Schemas are not domain models. Domain models contain schemas, but not the other way around. So be wary as you're going through your modeling that you don't fall into the black hole of canonicalization. It's a trap, right? If you have two things with two distinctly different semantic meanings, and but they look really close to being the same, resist the temptation to fold them into one thing. Sadness will ensue. Zoom levels. So here's kind of an eShop thing that is one of my favorite little demos. And you can see that we have a number of top level concerns represented by the clouds and that they interact with other parts of the model represented by the arrows. And that's kind of a level zero. It's kind of the big 100,000 foot view that shows an entire system of systems. Each of the clouds is kind of a system into itself. And so it's useful for understanding the relationships between systems. Level one shows for each system what the ins and outs are, right? Um, what it can offer to others, what it needs from others. Level two, we start to get down to be a little bit more granular and we see some of the abstractions and some of the things that we saw in some of the domain modeling. And we call this level the context map. Uh, this is a very stripped down context map diagram. And we'll dive into bigger and better ones shortly. And at level three, we talk about reification. So here are a bunch of C-sharp classes 
that are a small part of the eShop project that, that we're using and reification shows the actual implementation. And if you find you cannot go from the, the higher levels down to the actually here is my code level, what it means is either your code is implemented incorrectly in comparison to the model or your model's got a very bad set of glitches in it somewhere. And we'll talk about how to tell and give you some other guidance. Okay, preliminaries out of the way, we get to talk about what Eric Evans gave to the world, domain-driven design. And this is the classic book on domain-driven design. Um, there's a really nice set of books that follow on. Uh, this was the OG book. And uh, Eric has also given uh, lots of presentations and talks and videos and so have other people. But this is the book that I, when it first came out, I read and I was just stunned at how clear and how much my brain had it wrong and how I needed to rejigger my thinking, especially as I went through my career and built systems that were increasingly complex. They had lots of moving parts. Um, I've got a system I'm working on now that's got hundreds of moving parts, deployable units, hundreds. And without, you know, domain-driven design as a way of getting context to those things, it would be virtually impossible to understand. So there has to be a reason we care about domain-driven design. And Eric expresses it perfectly in a hierarchy of needs. We, we need to know why we're building this thing. And, you know, if we don't know why, the models we build won't mean anything. The what is the model, right? And, you know, if the why is wrong, the what is wrong. If the model is wrong, then the implementation details are wrong, right? And we won't, you know, the how will not be right and the who's will not be happy and the wins will be incorrect and we'll be very, very unhappy. Um, more importantly, our customers who are paying us to do this will be very, very unhappy. So it's important to start off all projects with a really strong why statement that shapes the resulting what. And as you model, as you go, oh, what about this thing? Or is this relationship? Or uh, do I need an entity here? Or whatever. You need to ask yourself, is it relevant to the why? And if it's not, then you have to wonder if you've wandered off. And are, you know, you're doing something that is outside the scope of the intention. The why is about intention. So that's just... A piece of advice, I at regular intervals as my team is building things, I stop them and I ask, is this serving the why? So here's some definitions, and we're going to talk about each one of these. Uh, each one of these is a couple of chapters in Eric's book and in subsequent books. I'm going to try to cover these like super quick by way of introduction, but... I, you know, we, one of the things that makes prog, uh, projects work versus not work is what Eric calls the ubiquitous language. And that is everybody who has a concern about the project, when we talk about the foo, we all have to mean exactly the same thing. And why are we modeling? We're modeling to make it so that we can reify the thing that we're planning to do. But if I'm talking to you and you think foo means this, and I think foo means that, and we don't have a model, uh, then we're in real trouble because the thing I deliver uh, for you may not be right. It probably won't be right. So having a ubiquitous uh, language that you know, everybody sits down and agrees on, like a glossary. And then we say, okay, within this glossary, we're going to have these domains and these models, 
and inside those, the, you know, those are going to be in context and have a bounded context. And we're going to talk about all those things. But, but what this devolves down to is when we use certain words, when we're talking about what we're trying to do, we have to be in agreement or unhappiness will ensue. So here is Eric's handy planogram of the relationship between all of the vocabulary words in his book. I know it's a lot, but as we pick some of these apart, we're not going to cover all of them, right? But as we pick some of the critical ones apart, they'll, it'll become obvious. And probably the most important thing in here is the context map, which is how we glue together our ubiquitous uh, language. So we're all talking about the same thing. And that's where the rubber hits the road in terms of implementation. So we're going to talk about context maps a lot. And for those of you who want to know what the numbers are, the numbers are on this handy dandy diagramming uh, guide. And again, you can go and read Eric's book or any of the excellent uh, on the web tutorials about DDD and, and understand each of these with. Uh, but we're going to hit the ones that uh, I, we think are the most relevant uh, in this. And then again, this isn't a complete tutorial. This is designed to let you, you know, get interested and know where to look. So we have this lemma. Lemma is a fancy Latin word meaning just a truth, this a rule. And if the and what we say is if the domains are wrong, that is the boundaries between entities, then the system's going to be fragile. And if we model correctly, referring back to the why, right, our, our systems are going to be robust and clean and easy to extend. So the pattern language of DDD. And again, it's always got to come back to the why. Why are we modeling and why are we making this system? So an entity by definition is idempotent. And in C-sharp, these things are typically classes. And they have one or more fields by which we can disambiguate one instance from another other than by all the other properties that the object may or may not have. But what it means is, is that when we're trying to get the entity or write the entity or, or modify the entity or delete the entity, that we can do it by ID. And this is not a staggeringly complicated new thing, right? If we're going to use entity framework, if we're going to, you know, facade things over SQL or no SQL, databases, having them be ID impotent is a big deal, right? And of course, our rule is, is that uh, entity identity should be immutable. Again, none of this is groundbreaking stuff. So anything that is ID impotent, that is an entity, can be the root of an aggregate. Ooh, what's that? So we're going to show you in a minute, but in a nutshell, an aggregate is customer to order, order to order details, order details to product, right? So I could represent a customer and one order by having that tree of objects and trees or graphs of objects are called aggregates in domain driven design and in math too. So, um, an entity can be a vertex. That is, it can be the beginning of a graph. If you don't have idempotency as a guarantee, when something is at the root of a graph, the graph is non-deterministic, which means it's hard to work with. And in fact, that's almost always a bad smell. So, we start by making good classes, and we'll talk about entities versus value objects in a minute. Um, we talk about, about interfaces, 
as part of shared kernels. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then, you know, constants and enumerations uh, that are that oval shape, right, that constrain the values of data in our entities are value objects, and then we have delegates and events, and those can represent domain events. And we'll talk more about that. So these are sort of the building blocks that we're going to use to grok the domain-driven idea. So here's a sample aggregate. It's the one I called out a minute ago, where because customer is got a unique ID, it can be the root of an aggregate. And so we have, you know, composition, composition, then association. In this case, as shown in the modeler that's in Visual Studio notation instead of mine, but it's still the same idea. And so we can see that, you know, I can say, well, for this customer, ID, blah, go get me the order order number blah, which is also a unique ID, so it can be the root of an aggregate. And then it will go fetch all the order details, which in turn will point to all the products. In implementation, the um, product property might be lazy loaded as, as, if we were, as if you were doing it in entity framework. You can say, well, I only want to go get the, pro the product itself if I want to dot my way from product ID all the way through to get the product name or um, the price. So domain events are pretty simple. If we think about internal versus external events of our, of our system, we talk about internal events being things that pass between entities in our own code. So in C Sharp, I might declare a delegate and then I might have um, callbacks from other classes register with using that delegate. And then when the class they're registered with has a state change of some kind or something interesting happens, it will raise an event and all of its subscribers will get the event and can do something about it. An external event is something that happens between components running in different execution spaces. So, you know, it's all the normal queue intermediations or messaging intermediations we're used to. Azure Service Bus, Rabbit, Kafka, um, all those things are all examples of intermediates. And you may even have a direct connection where um, service A registers a callback with service B. When service B does something, it calls back service A. That's a lot of coupling. It's not always the best idea, but sometimes it is useful. But from the DDD point of view, whether the event is internal or external, it's just saying, look, something happened in here that other things need to know about. And we say an event is the way we're going to communicate that change. It's usually a state change. And if you think about it, if you have a processing pipeline or a processing chain, um, and I go from, you know, uh, order captured to order validated to, you know, um, order broken into suborders to whatever, each one of those things could be evented if somebody else has a need to care about it. And when in doubt, make your, um, the different steps in your workflow, particularly in Saga workflows, by default capable of raising events in case anybody's interested. At runtime, the cost is generally fairly low. So again, value objects, we talk about classes, structs, records, constants, and enumerations. Classes are the rare case. It's rare to see a value object as a class. 
but it could happen. So let me give you an example of a value object that you could implement as either a class or a struct and or record, and there are pros and cons to each. And that is our classic conundrum of we need an address. So we might have um, an address type that follows the International Postal Convention. So it's going to have four address lines of 40 characters. It's going to have a city of 40 characters. It's going to have a, a, a locator of 40 characters. So for the United States, that would be the state. Um, other places would be other things. And then it would have a postal code. And, you know, a postal code could be a zip code in the United States or a postal routing code in Canada or whatever. So, and that value object doesn't really exist outside of something in context, right? You need two pieces of context. One is who owns that address? And the second is how are they using it? So for customer, we might keep track of their billing address and their mailing address separately. For a more complicated thing where our customer is a corporation, we might have a very complicated set of, of address entity relations, right? And in a lot of cases in like ordering systems, the, the order owns the shipping address, not the customer. Although the customer can have a default shipping address because for an order, if you think about like the Amazon experience, by default, they go, well, you want this shipped to your house, right? And you previously keyed that in. But, you know, you could be sending something to your Nana. And so in that case, the address doesn't go with the customer. It goes with the order. It's where the order is to be delivered to. So value objects are always in the context of who owns them and for what. And address is the obvious one. But phone numbers are a slightly less obvious one. Typically, phone number is phone numbers are you know just a text or string field, and nobody thinks about them very much. And sometimes we throw a regular expression attribute on them to force them to be formatted a certain way. But in fact, they can have behavior, and so they might be worth turning into a struct. And the other thing about turning them into a class, a struct, or a record is that those things are named. So when I'm looking at my customer object and it says mailing address as a field and its type is address, I go, aha, this is a standardized address thing in my domain model. And therefore, I know exactly what the business rules are around this thing. Same thing for phone number. So it's, it's important to know that value objects can be more than just constants or enumerations, right? They can be used to express complex types that can only exist relative to some owning thing. And that owning thing has to be an entity. It has to be ID impotent. Right? This address belongs to customer 47. And what kind of thing is it? It's the shipping address. So here's some examples of, of you know, value objects in action. We talked about two of them, order status and address. And, and you can see that the difference between um, address and and for example, customers is that address, although it's a complex type, is not ID impotent, but the type itself provides useful information to the system. It's an address thing. We know what address things are all about. And an order status is technically in DDD a set. It's in other words, you can only, this field can only take on these values. That's it, right? It's used to constrain the values inside a type. So, in the abstract, right, DDD thinks about um, factories and understand that 
A factory could be a classic factory in C sharp where you have, you know, um, a, you know, a, you can't actually new up an, an address. Instead, you call the dot add factory oh, or sorry, the dot add address uh, overload on your on your class and you pass it in the required fields. Um, often factories in languages like C sharp are used to enforce business rules rather than letting people construct the the child object like address directly. So it's useful for baking in some validation and business rules and consistency and formatting rules, things like that. But understand that a factory in DDD could be a repository. So a context object in entity framework is thought of as being a factory in the sense that you can say, you know, my customer context dot customers dot get by ID 47. And it materializes an instance of customer and so on. A side note that singleton data objects are an anathema. A single computation is not. So we want to do our computing in one place. And we want our data objects to either be ID impotent or classic value objects attached to an entity, which is ID impotent. So modules is just this generic thing. Every programming language has its own way of grouping code together. And so in C sharp, it's files, folders, and namespaces. And then up from that projects and solutions. Um, and, you know, that's just how you want to lump and split the code. And what they say is, is that modules should derive from the domain model. And we'll, we'll see why that's important in a minute. <clears throat> but modules and their contents are all part of our ability to talk about a ubiquitous language. And so one of the things I've seen that's dreadful is you go look at the code and you see a class with some name and you go, oh, I don't quite know what that is. And so you open up the domain model in another window and that class is not in the domain model because um, they decided to just use some other different name. And so now you're not sure, well, it kind of smells like this thing, but it's not. So, you know, part of being having a ubiquitous language is that it needs to be turtles all the way down, right? If you're using, if you have a, an organizational, you know, mechanism in your models, you should have the same organizational mechanism to the degree it's sane in your code. And that's what the idea of modules are. So let's get back to ubiquitous language because I we can't emphasize how important this is. Uh, if if the definitions for your system are in many many places, if they are hard to find, if they are impenetrable, they're written in jargon, then they're not very useful. And chances are that the resulting implementations will not be excellent. The other thing is, it's not just a glossary or data dictionary, right? It's about, it's going to have, you know, diagrams in it that describe the semantics of cardinality, of interaction, etc. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of old school. I like UML for this, but you could use anything that makes you happy. The purpose, is, the purpose of diagrams is not to conform to some diagramming standard, mm -hmm but to be able to effectively communicate to your stakeholders, technical and business, what it is you're proposing to do. So that they can point at that and go, oh, well, in real life, you know, this thing's over here. And, oh, we no, see that, no. right? And have that discussion, at which point you update your ubiquitous language and the domain models that go with it. So, you know, one little helpful hint from Heloise is if you're in a meeting and people are are conflating vocabulary, they're using this word for that word and vice versa, and they have it's and the semantic difference is important, you know, like the difference between customer and user or whatever, 
then you should hold up a hand and just very firmly but politely say, you know, it's really important for our understanding, you know, as a developer or business analyst or whatever your role is that we kind of consistently use this thing. So let's just stop and make sure that everybody is clear and when we say something's a foo, what foo is and what it is not. So there's a chain that I think I've, we've spoken of before, and it's one of those things where the ubiquitous language leads to a set of semantics, which must be right or the model will be wrong, which means the syntax will be wrong. The syntax you can think of as the actual implementation, and then the system will suffer. And the reverse is true. If the ubiquitous language is careful and consistent, which yields along with that, you know, models and diagrams that are careful and consistent, then the resulting models will produce syntax, which is clean and systems, which are, are nicely solid, right? That individual things have a single responsibility and so forth. See, we got all the way back to solid again. So, Context gets bandied about quite a bit, but context is just like it is in our everyday communication, which is the use of a word or phrase or idea depends on the other words, phrases, and ideas that surround it. That's a context, right? And so if I am talking about foo, then... I need to be really specific about whether I mean, you know, foo the idea, foo the entity, foo the implementation, and those things should be related to each other, remember. Um, but, you know, contexts are also kind of the boundaries that say, you know, inside the shopping and carting experience, we have two contexts, the product searching context and the carding context. And it sort of draws a line around the functionality that goes in each. And then we can define how we want those things to behave and be represented. So, you know, what does this thing mean in the scope of its parent and its neighbors? Bounded context is making that formal. And in modeling, we say, eh, this is the hard line between this set of things and that sort of things. And in C Sharp, in .NET, if you're doing this properly, one area that bounded contexts are really useful is if you consider a uh, top-level namespace to be a bounded context, and then the sub-namespaces allow you to make you know, little subdivisions of context within that, you are probably on the right track. That is to say, a bounded context and a namespace is a pretty nice equivalency in, in C Sharp. So the relationship between the searching for products context and the carding things context is shown on a context map. A context map is, what is the relationship between this set of stuff and that set of stuff? So typically, if we have this set of stuff and that set of stuff, we want to make sure that context one cannot just reach into context two and do whatever it wants. That it filters the interactions between contexts with a service intermediation. Now, when DDD says the word service, if you're a C-sharp developer, you're probably thinking web API, but in fact, it doesn't have to be that. It can just be an API. You know, this class protects the innards of, of this context and its objects. And I can only talk to this context and its objects through this service, this set of APIs, right? And what those APIs do is they provide something called an anti-corruption layer. And in software engineering, you have an anti-corruption layer anytime you have an API 
that is the only one allowed to get to the soft creamy innards of something, and everybody else has to interact with the API. That's an anti-corruption layer. And that's what we shoot for. So just be sure that when you're talking about services, you have context in mind. If we're talking about modeling, what we're saying is, oh yeah, we need something to sit between this part of the model and that part of the model and make sure that everybody follows the rules when they're accessing this part of the model. So it's not, don't conflate it with the implementation. If someone says service, just generically, you need to hold up a hand and say, do you mean in the diagramming sense or do you mean in the implementation sense? And if it's an implementation, is it an API or is it a wire interaction of some kind, right? Because you can, it doesn't matter what the wire protocol is, as long as A is talking to B and there's code on the other end it's talking to and not the soft creamy innards of the other domain, you have a service interaction wired or not, in memory, out of memory, in DDD, those things are services. So why do we need context maps? Well, we need context maps to make sure that when we have uh, a, a set of entities and value types, that they have clear boundaries, right? That we're building a context and that when this pool of stuff needs to interact with that pool of stuff, we're doing it through a service. And if we don't do that, like we were to lump them all into one big puddle, you'd end up with something called a big ball of mud in DDD terms, where everything can talk to everything and everything else can go to everything. And, and in networking, we'd say that that model is both porous, that is, you can get into its creamy innards from the outside, and promiscuous, which is to say that anything can talk to something, anything else, unchecked by a policy. And by the way, the implementation of a policy is the idea of a domain-driven design service. So... The other thing about it is, is that if you have good context with good context maps, then you can, you know, cut a piece out and go, you know what, I could use this thing over there on this other project and you haven't done any harm. So, and then if, to top it off, if the relationship between our context that's shown in the map is service intermediated to provide an anti-corruption layer and is well segregated using some of the same principles of of service oriented architecture and it's made using some of the ideas of microservices that things should be reusable right then we're able to have this idea where we don't have to go out of our way to make A talk to B. We don't have to do a lot of transformation or translation. And that happy place is called being conformist. Again, it's a modeling term. It doesn't mean uh, being conformist, you know, in other ways, like everybody has to wear blue socks or something. It just means that we have designed a system that is robust enough that in between chunks of our model that we have nice crisp boundaries and we have service interoperations with that are that are obvious how to use and all of it is reflected in both the model and the implementation so you know we have to think about callers versus callees which is pretty familiar to those of you who've written any kind of api and then, you know, you want to be able to express those published, those, those, those rules, this, you know, what does this mean? How to use this in a published language? And so, for example, um, we could use something like open API to define any, uh, the interaction between two contexts, right? That has, you know, DTOs and operations 
that hide the implementation of the underlying context over here, but allow other contexts to use it when they need to use it, and enforcing the policies required to keep external forces from doing something horrible to the soft, creamy innards of this other dom of our domain, right? So if you go to diagram something and you end up with something that looks like the flying spaghetti monster, you probably have a very poorly defined um, domain boundaries, and which means that your bounded contexts are wrong and your modeling is wrong and you have stuff protruding outside your own context. And you're probably looking at something that will be very unhappy making. Or you just diagrammed it in a way that made it look god awful. One of the two. So, but just it's a warning, Will Robinson. Like if you look at a diagram at any of the the zoom levels we talked about before, and it looks like, you know, a million connected lines, something horrible has gone wrong. Um, you want to see a lot of empty space in well-constructed models with nice, crisp boundaries. So, we talked about porousness before um, and promiscuousness, right? And we, you know, the internal implementation of your service tier in the real world, right? Um, you know, there's a discipline to that, right? And so things like Entity Framework are designed to help you build an abstraction between your business logic and your storage tier. So, so, in the real world, there are some real world problems, like trimming. So, if I have a customer, and I go and do a get customer by ID on customer 99, and that customer has 10,000 orders, and I try to drag them across the wire and load them in memory, chances are my thing will explode or take forever and time out or something equally horrible. And if I try to then go get all the order details and all the products, right, that's awful. So the solution is typically um, to implement some sort of lazy loading, but the reality is that we probably want to design our APIs in such a way that what actually happens is we say, look, I want to go and get the list of orders for this customer between these two dates or the most recent order or orders only in this status, right? That's where APIs, AKA services really shine because they allow us to do graph trimming, only fetch the things that we need, and they enforce in usage that people go in and do same sorts of inquiries against our underlying schema. So they enforce filtering, right? So I'm not gonna be able to expose a customer get all orders method but I will be able to expose a customer dot get order by ID, right? So customer 99 order one, two, three, four, that's perfectly legit usually. Um, unless of course it's got a million order details, but even then we want to have filtering and filtering and filtering, right? Along with lazy loading. And that idea is graph trimming. So here is a, a typical, customer order, order detail, product kind of graph. And in this case, it, it, what we're showing is that we reduced pulling back the entire graph, parts of the graph aren't shown for brevity, by applying trimming. So we said, go get the most recent two orders for cu customer 47. And in return, um, we then said, you know, and load the order detail on the products. And in memory, the products are 
are deduplicated. So frameworks like Entity Framework uh, won't load the same product item twice. They'll just have a pointer from this object to that object in memory. So, you know, trimming is important. So the problem with trimming is collisions. What happens when two different processes try to modify the details of order 47. And the answer is, wow, in real life, that almost never happens, no matter what the business says. And the other is, is we need to have a conflict resolution mechanism baked into our implementation in case that actually really does happen. And we'll talk about that in, when we talk about concurrency levels. But in my whole life, other than in really terribly designed systems, I've rarely seen a case where two different processes are making changes to the same record at the same time. And if that is happening, something about the overall domain-driven design is probably wrong. So here's some thoughts about consistency and concurrency levels. And here's the document for two different ways of understanding them. Um, one for non-SQL and one for SQL. That you have to bear in mind when you're thinking about implementing the persistence tier. And again, if you find you're having collisions a lot, um, especially in your early testing, you may want to rethink your domain model. It may be that the entity that's in contention is actually a big ball of mud, that in fact, there is a root part of the entity that's unlikely to change. And then there are different parts or attributes of that entity that can be mo moved into their own um value objects or even sub entities that will remove the concurrency problem because I can then update the, the customer's preferences and someone else can update their orders and somebody else can update their refunds and somebody else can write and, and we won't collide. So collision is, is often a sign of poorly thought out something where you end up with kind of uber classes or mother of all classes things. And so the guidance that you get from the tooling that says, hey, you know, this chunk of code is way too big and complicated. You might want to break it up is trying to tell you that you're going to create concurrency and consistency problems, but you're also heading on a collision course for a big ball of mud where something becomes unobtainable. Likewise, the opposite is true. There was a fad for a while that every property should be an object and every object should be an object of an object. And that's too far, right? As there was something in the middle. But what domain-driven design does is it lets you draw circles around properties and ask the question, these are always going to be part of the same change set. So maybe they should be a value object on my entity or maybe they belong to their own um, set of sub-entities. That's typically true with things that are in lists, like orders, in which case we want to apply filtering. And in so doing, we also help avoid collision. So there are three classic con concurrency strategies. There are actually more implementations of these. And understanding the really granular differences between them requires some deep computer science and math chops typically. But they devolve down to last one in wins, optimistic. So I'm just going to assume no one's going to write. And if someone beats me to the right, I'm going to throw a thing I'm going to have to resolve. Or pessimistic, or we resort to locking. In modern enterprise and cloud systems, anything that depends on pessimistic logging is going to have a dreadful throughput in real life. So again, the strategy that is generally the best is optimistic. And 
if we find we're having collisions because more than one system is trying to update the same thing, then we have not made our implementation of that object in from a single entity into a graph or into you know into an aggregate in a way that lets different concerns update different parts without colliding and only one domain or context should be allowed to make the change so for a customer object the base customer properties of first name last name customer number you know um you know gold silver platinum should only be allowed by the customer system and then maybe the preference engine has an api exposed just for it to keep track of their preferences and there's another api exposed on it for orders that allows you know constrained entry to the orders and we can do that because we have partitioned our our you know everything all in one class to smaller pieces that make sense So, you know, understanding how to do trimming on, on entity graphs to get a sane projection is really important. And it's also important to understand the intention. By and large, when you go to implement domain-driven design things, you should follow the CQRS pattern, e.g., you should separate the reads and the writes. And what that allows you to do is to fetch arbitrary projections that are for reading only, but they contain the, you know, the keys or the IDs so that then if you need to then modify one of those objects, you can make a second call to reify an editable object which is sane in the scope of the aggregate, which is the graph. So CQRS and DDD go well together because they allow you to tackle real world problems like reporting and populating a screen and things from the, oh, and by the way, I need to add, update, delete this part of the tree. So Domain boundary bad smells, right? A domain is a context of context, right? It's a group of things that are all related to each other and have a lot of interaction. And drawing domain boundaries is hard. And again, domain boundaries often will become, you know, top level namespaces and then the um, bounded context inside become sub namespaces when you implement them in C sharp and you may break those into the, the domains into their own DLLs or whatever. But what you want to avoid doing is building distributed monoliths. And if you find that you are, are exchanging DTOs to keep the same fundamental entity represented two different ways in sync, you're now squarely in the two watches problem. And that's a bad smell. So that leads us to, to a piece of advice that Larry gave, which is that an aggregate, e.g. a graph, should only exist in one domain. So what do we do when domains collide? So if we have overlapping entities, and let's say we have two different entities that care about customer, maybe customer shouldn't be part of either of those domains. Maybe customer should belong to the customer domain with its own service interpol inner positioning and then the other two domains just need to be able to hold on to references to specific customers so if you have a situation where not just duct typedly but in reality a graph is in you know an entity hierarchy is in two places the thing to do is to pull it into its own domain and then wrap it in a service to keep 
that domain safe. It's perfectly acceptable for one domain to hold references to another as long as the entities inside the shared domain or common domain are IDM potent. Same thing happens when you have a set of enumerations or constants or something like address or phone number. The thing to do is to pull it into a shared kernel, which is just a fancy way of saying it's not part of domain A, it's not part of domain B. Anybody can implement these abstract things. And so you can put things like interfaces, constants, enumerations into what DDD calls a shared kernel, and then each of the domains can happily use it. And as we update, for example, an enumeration to add new values, following the rules of the programming language and best practices, uh, both domains benefit and neither are harmed. So that leads us to, well, what do we do about communication between domains? Well, it turns out the answer is exactly the same. We define events and their messages in a shared kernel that both systems use. And one system is capable of raising an event uh, with a specific message type, and another one is capable of subscribing to it. But the events and the messages themselves are outside of either domain, just like the example before. And in the case where domain A and domain B are talking to each other across a wire, what we can do is we can use something like an open API scheme or some other thing like that, uh, a chunk of YAML, whatever, to describe the contract between them. And as long as they both implement the contract of the same version in the same way, and by the way, yes, versioning is not optional for contracts, um, then we're quite happy to see that contract evolve and still be durable. And if B changes, A doesn't necessarily have to change and vice versa if we do it properly. So how to think about architecture in DDD terms, right? So here's this abstraction from Jimmy Nielsen, which I kind of like. And, and he breaks it into these four chunks where the domain is, you know, we would say maybe we call them business objects or we'd call them, um, you know, the implementation of the application is obviously a container for that. And then that runs on infrastructure. And in Jimmy's universe, the infrastructure also includes things like SQL Server, Cosmos DB, something like that. But, you know, can you make this separation from when you look at your domain model, can you say, well, yeah, I see how I could apply this. In the real world, you wouldn't necessarily implement strictly this, but you'd implement this idea. So Rocky Latka, fantastic architect and, and the contributor uh, of, of a very popular framework for C-sharp developers called CSLA he says, well, you know, you can think about it by thinking about it in terms of composition, right? We have interfaces, interface control, business logic, data access, and persistence. We roll those five things into an application and not every application has all of them. We roll those into systems, we roll systems into solutions. And that's a compositional model, right? And that's actually a very practical architecture. And if you go and you need to build a, a business application with lots of business rules and business logic, CSLA is a nice way of doing it. And their model for implementing it and mapping domain-driven design onto it is compositional. So, you know, the green boxes would represent one or more bounded contexts inside of our bigger domain model that then is aggregated. And by the time it gets to the system level, we're talking about domain to domain communication, and that results in a nice durable solution. And he's got lots of content about this idea. 
I tend to think from the network up because that's how I came through the world. And so when I'm looking at a domain driven design, I ask myself, how would I chunk that up and put it into kind of the generic enterprise networking model where I'm assuming that the cold, cruel internet is on one side and our tender inner creamy bits are on the, on the right side. <clears throat> and so I would tend to put, you know, I'd say, well, I'm going to need some service in, in interposition and some maybe presentation tier. And then my, my real domains and domain things will be via APIs of my app tier. And then my persistence tier will take care of itself. And so that's another way of thinking about it. So if you look at all three of these models and you're able to take your domain driven design that you've arted up and made, and you're able to apply these three ideas and know specifically where you intend to put each piece, you probably have a pretty good model. So we need to stop and talk about kind of deployable units because in order to put things into those boxes on the previous slide, we need to be able to make deployable units. And a deployable unit is exactly what it sounds like. It is a unit of deployment. So if I have a web API and I compile it, I'm going to compile it and its dependent libraries and, and instructions about how to obtain configuration and things like that. I'm going to deploy it into the appropriate tier and um, within that, I'll have a number of DLLs, and in those DLLs, which again, I typically think of and structure as being domain boundaries, inside of those, I'll have namespaces that will contain the aggregates, entities, shared kernels, libraries, right? And so, and then I'll also think about, well, you know, I need a supporting SQL schema and I need to make sure that I have a place to put files like in blob storage or whatever. And, and then I'll try to, you know, go through my domain model, use a little highlighter and I put in marks that say sort of what piece this is part of. And sometimes I'll, I'll make a circle around multiple domains and say, well, really practically, well, although there are different domains, we're going to host them in the same set of hosts. And so, you know, I'm going to de deploy and scale them together. But then I give myself the out of being able, if one of them turns out to be the, tr the classic noisy neighbor, it gets called a lot more. It's a resource hog, whatever. I'll be able to go back and rethink my deployable units and pull the noisy neighbor out and give it its own infrastructure and resource pools. And then it can just live without bothering its neighbors, but they still talk to each other. So we talked a lot about, we need rules to have an any corruption layer, a gateway, an API, a set of business rules, right? And we want to have, typically we want those things to exist in a shared kernel. Remember, a shared kernel is this thing that's outside of a domain model, right? It's a set of reusable, useful things. So events and messages and enumerations and constants and delegates and et cetera, et cetera, right? So the idea is, again, we want to protect the creamy inner goodness of our domain from people, others that are interacting with it and prevent via policy inappropriate interactions. So in every system we think about there being a need for business rules and business rules have long been a tough conversation among domain driven design modelers because it can be difficult to know where um, to put business rules and fundamentally, right? A business rule is anything that meets the Turing criteria, right? It enhances, changes, or evaluates data. So rules come in to sort of two big buckets from a computer science abstraction point of view. 
inferential rules and action rules. Inferential rules are executed when you have a, uh, let's say you have an entity graph and you want to feed it to your rules engine and go, is this okay? Does this conform to my policy? So I might have an entity graph that represented an insurance claim and I want to give it to the, is this a bogus claim engine? Those are typically inferential engines. Um, event condition action rule sets on the flip side are typically done as things, as events are raised, the events are evaluated and actions are taken based on the conditions that are part of that set of processes that are triggered by the event. So you can think of like a message that's on a RabbitMQ showing up at your function and that would trigger an event condition action, right? It's an event because the message met the conditions that required your function to take action. Now, these aren't crisp differentiations, right? There's always a little bit of mixing involved here. But if you can strive for semi-purity to the Pareto kind of 80% place, you'll be a lot happier about how you implement business rules and you'll be a lot more thoughtful and methodical about where they live and how they can be evaluated and how they can be both separate and yet part of your entity model graphs and aggregates. And of course, the way to do that, as we said on the previous slide, is to make them part of a shared kernel, e.g. outside the main flow of code. And, and that is, is true of most of the rule engines in C Sharp. It's just not obvious that it's true. For example, system annotations are attributes that you can put on members of a class to enforce certain rules. So there's a phone number attribute. And it, what it does is it enforces that the phone number has certain characters and not other characters, and that it follows one of several patterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that's an inferential rule. You may have validators that happen in your API. So if you if you've ever been in Visual Studio and you're coding along and Visual Studio pops up and goes, hey, you're passing parameter foo, but you don't check parameter foo, then what it's trying to tell you is you need to add an, an ECA, an event condition action, e.g. if this parameter is not like these things, throw an exception because something bad happened. Right. And there are different rules engines out in the world above and beyond what's provided by the .NET framework. Um, many of them use either um, graph uh, OH or, um, or some other engine that uses the REIT algorithm. And you can go look on Wikipedia and read all about REIT. That's a way where you can take a bunch of inference rules or event condition action rules and optimize their execution so that it doesn't have to evaluate every rule. As soon as you have a critical rule failure in one rule, it stops execution and says, nope, this failed, and here's why. And there are pluses and minuses. Um, inferential rule sets are nice in that you can give back by evaluating all the rules, you can give back a comprehensive list of complaints. But in the case where your goal is throughput, you'd simply want to stop the first time one of the rules is violated, particularly in event condition action flows like message intermediated systems and so on. So you have to weigh where they are. There is not one one rules engine or one rules approach to rule them all. Um, there are different kinds of rules and you have to evaluate which kind of rule is best to use where and then where it's possible to ensorcel that, that rule logic uh, 
into a shared kernel, you should do that. But again, applying the Pareto rule, if it just isn't going to get reused or it doesn't make sense or it's too hard, then just make sure that your rule evaluations are somehow separated from the rest of your logic, at least wrapped in a method, right? So that you can see where your rules are in one place. So there's this little chart that um, Rocky and Larry and I and others contributed to, and we were trying to give advice as to where to put rules depending upon whether you're in an online transaction processing kind of modality where you know there's a data entry screen and a user whether or not you have you're sending batches of data to a service getting them validated and sending them back or whether or not there's there's a long you know, chain of business processing that's happening generally unattended, right? Like ETLs and sagas and no UI things. And here is kind of our guidance. The green check is, okay, this might be a good strategy. And, uh, you know, a question mark is eh, maybe, maybe not. And a red nod is, in our experience, this turns out to be not a good place to park rules for this scenario. So we hope this helps. So, rolling all of this up, a domain is a collection of related models inside contexts with reasonable coupling and good cohesion protected by a gateway, e.g. service, and domains interact with each other via the gateways, e.g. services, by using representations in shared kernels. So let's revisit services for a minute. So a service is a bridge between one part of your model and another. And remember, it doesn't have to be a web service, right? It can be an API, it can be whatever. But basically, the purpose of a service is to provide an anti-corruption layer to your domain. So that being said, here's some do's and don'ts that over time, we have found are pretty good rules for how to write good services or good APIs. Um, do use canonical models. Remember I said earlier that canonicalization was a trap? Well, it's not a trap for data transfer objects or contract objects. They really should be canonical. That doesn't mean that you should use canonicalization to resolve um, aggregates in two different domains. That's bad. But an agreement that we're going to pass this datagram for this operational interaction being canonical is a good thing, but it goes in a shared context, not a domain. Don't use domain entities or aggregates for as DTOs except inside the domain itself. In other words, don't expose them outside of the domain. Do make your intention of your API clear. So if you're writing C-sharp code, XML code comments, so that as people are trying to use your API, they get little pop-up hints, right? These are good things. Um, don't have side effects. Do have assertions, like, you know, an assertion would be any kind of business rule that says, look, um, the thing you gave me is awful, and here's why. <clears throat> and to give operations closure. And I'm not going to delve into what closure means here. But you can go read up on closure on Wikipedia. For those of you who know what closure is, um, you know, again, it goes back to the don't have side effects thing. And it has to do with governing the lifetime of instances at runtime. So lumping and splitting, right, is the classic problem because you, when you're working on a project and you're doing your, your domain modeling, you're going to say, well, okay, does this thing belong to this thing? Should we merge these things together? Should they be separate? And throughout this talk, I've tried to call out different 
pivots or decision-making things. Remember I said if we had, as an example, if we had a collision between multiple different kinds of domains trying to make updates to the same object, maybe we have the wrong object granularity. Or maybe we're creating um, subdivisions where the relationship is one-to-one -one and it could be folded in. Or we folded something in, but we realized that the cardinality between them is wrong. And those of you who have studied SQL Server and understand the ro rules of third normal form will, will immediately recognize that the same rules that allow you to build decent schemas in SQL Server also apply to domain-driven modeling. That is to say, we don't repeat ourselves and we make sure that the, that any two things have a very crisp definition of cardinality and that we understand the parent and child or sibling relationships, etc. And so, you know, you can take the advice we've given throughout this talk and say, okay, this is some things to think about. So think of this slide as being a checklist of things to think about. And of course, we have directionality. And you should agree on these vocabulary words, like, you know, um, upstream, do, do, downstream, cross-domain, mutually dependent. Um, mutually dependent is like one of those things where you see it, it, may, it should make you unhappy, but sometimes it's unavoidable. I'll give you a real world example. Um, the, the, the customer service and order management subsystem on an e-commerce site, for the customer service function to work, it needs to know a lot about orders and their status. And users that conform to the right policy, e.g. our customer support people, have to make order changes, which then may have a knock-on effect of the processing of the order in the order subsystem. It's just a reality but it can be very unhappy making. Ideally, things are unidirectional, but that's not always possible. And you should, you should disambiguate the case where A calls B and then B raises an event back to A to tell it something. That's not the same as being mutually dependent, where you can actually get in like round trips or worse, infinite loops between the domains. So here's some things, right? Semantic versioning is in the modern universe, not a negotiable. It just should be. And if you're on a team and somebody with juice says, I hate semantic versioning, we're not using it, it'll all be fine then your resume should spit out of the laser printer and you should go find somewhere else because you are heading to failure town at ballistic velocities. Um, just because you're downstream, uh, you know, you're a service consumer of a domain, doesn't mean you have to live with what was proposed, right? You should help them iterate and push back and consider your scenarios and not have to make 42,000 calls to get the thing you need and to support the kinds of projections and set operations and trimming that you need for your use cases. And if you find that your calls fail a lot because of missing prerequisites, then you need to explain to the team that owns that gateway, that API, right, that anti-corruption layer, that they're not doing a very good job documenting what is required, where to get it from, or how to know if it's right. And then just temporal coupling is just a very bad thing. If I need to call method A before I call method B, and it's related to time and not state. So, okay, I have to call create customer and get a customer back before I can call create order on a customer. That's not temporal coupling. 
Temporal coupling is there is a business process and it's got three steps and you've got to call step one, then step two, and then step three within a certain time window or she no worky. That's temporal coupling and it's evil. In order delivery is a bad smell. Um, nothing kills enterprise systems faster than the business insisting on in order delivery of messages or whatever, first come, first serve, what have you, because invariably as an alternative to in order delivery, you can do massively massive delivery in parallel and then you can have business rules that sort out who wins, like an auction, right? You don't want to let one bid come in at a time. You let all the bids come in, and then you close the bidding, and then you sort out who done it. Same thing for stock trading, right? They do some reconciliation during the day, but the big reconciliation happens after the training, wo training window. So be aware of temporal coupling and in-order delivery. And lastly, be aware that monopoly and monosopoly are bad things. If you have one domain that's completely ensorcelled by another, why are they two domains? If you have something that is in your model and yet other than one unidirectional like event notifications doesn't participate in your system, it's probably not a part of your system. It's an integration to your system, and that's not the same thing. Okay, this has been a long discussion, but I leave you with the timeless advice of John Wooden as we talk about implementation dilemmas. Worms are great. I love Entity Framework when it does what I want it to. But, you know, if you start from the data model up, which is how a lot of us used to enter the world, um, you will find that when you go to do the implementations in the real world without considering domain-driven design uh, and you couple everything in your business realm to the underlying storage schema, you will be very, very unhappy. And the bigger your system is, the more ballistically quickly your unhappiness will come. Likewise, semantic breaks, like people not obeying semantic versioning are bad. Syntactic breaks are bad, like somebody arbitrarily changes our shared kernel without versioning, without anything, and changes a contract and its DTOs, and they, they break the world because they needed it to change and there wasn't any discuss discussion. And then beware of, you know, where did this interface go? I was gonna use that. Or, hey, where did all that stuff come from? What is that doing on that? That doesn't make any sense. That's metastasis otherwise known as the creeping cruds of software. So that's, you know, and the creeping cruds, you know, the way to defeat that is think Yagni, you ain't gonna need it. Um, and to always be as an architect or a designer, thinking about the cost trade-off of doing it now versus doing it later and which one would be cheaper or wiser? And I tend to be a Yagni guy, so I tend to go, well, when we get the refined requirements for this, we'll reevaluate our domain model and see where it really belongs instead of, I'm going to tack this onto this because I may need it someday. That, in my personal history, has made me unhappy, so I, I try to be good about not doing that. And then lastly, you know, when you're actually implementing, think about architectural priorities. So that's been me as uh, some thoughts on domain-driven design. Thank you for your kind attention.